Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter-Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for giving us a little, a little bit of your time to better understand this intersection and to listen to another excellent Latter-Gay Stories interview and another ex excellent one we have for you today. I'm excited to have uh, Cameron in the, in the studio today being able to uh, share his story and give us a little insight into his journey, which is always uh, super important for the Latter-Gay Stories listeners. If you're following along on a video version of the podcast episode, we invite you to use the comment section. Whether you're catching this on our premiere or uh, later, we still invite you to use that comment se section to ask questions, to share your thoughts, feelings, and opinions on this episode. But most importantly, just to interact as a community. We invite you to do that. And if you are listening on an audio version of the podcast through one of our audio podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and give us a rating as well. It's those ratings that help us to expand uh, the reach of the Latter-Gay Stories podcast. Uh, in effect, it gives us an opportunity to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. And for that, we are thankful for those who help uh, by sharing episodes like this. Now, on to our episode. Um, welcoming Cameron to the Latter-Gay Stories studio. Cameron's got a uh, very, I don't want to say typical uh, Mormon story, but it's it's super familiar for a lot of us who are um, at this intersection of sexuality and religion. Um, Cameron's story uh, is very familiar for those who grew up in, um, I don't want to say overly orthodox Mormonism, but those who have uh, a structured religious household. Um, difficult to find words to explain who and what you are. And most importantly, the, the path and the, the, yeah, the path that we take to hide who and what we are in order to try to become something that we're not. So I know that's a super broad um, explanation or introduction, but Cameron, welcome to the studio and, and uh, thank you for giving us a little bit of your time to share your story. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now, um, we can jump into your story more chronological, but first, um, why don't you give the audience an opportunity to get to know who uh, Cameron is today? Yeah, I am a native of Arizona. I live in Tempe. I grew up here, out, out, out in Queen Creek, actually, uh, born and raised in the Mormon Church. Um, I am one of five kids and have lived most of my life in Arizona. Um, I am a Eagle Scout, a return missionary, a BYU graduate, and a chiropractor. And uh, I'm also divorced, and I've got three kids. Do you still remember the... Um a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, I'm, I'm, was friendly, it, courteous, kind, obedient. Oh yeah, I can go on. <laughs> was that the scout law? Is that yeah? Uh, or, or the no? I know what the oath is. Yeah, it's not the oath. I think the law. I think it is the law. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that just took me back a really. <laughs> I know long it's been time. a while. <laughs> oh man. So you made it all the way to. What was your Eagle Scout project? There is, so at the time we lived in Springville, Utah uh, from my freshman year and because I couldn't get my license before I had my eagle. And there was a park next to the Springville, Utah Cemetery and all the trees in that park were planted by me and my friends from my Eagle Scout project. So good times. <laughs> yeah, that seems like it would be a pretty big undertaking. Yeah, it and, was fun. And now all these years later, those trees are probably... Pretty stately. Last time I saw them, 10 years ago, they looked great. So. <laughs> All right, Cameron, um, where do we start with your story? Um, as, as we were discussing this kind of off air, it really, like, like the genesis of uh, the point where you've realized, I feel different, happened pretty mm -hmm. young. Yeah, I think about this a lot. Um, I think I noticed when I was probably around the age of nine that I just felt a little different. Uh, I wasn't as into all the same things as other uh, boys my age. Um, I looked at things differently. We'd go to the go to the store, and I would be uh, fascinated at the the underwear aisles. And that, of course, got more <laughs> intense the older I got. But uh, yeah, I think I started to, to feel different around nine years old. The underwear, honestly, the underwear aisle got so many of us. I, mean, I remember <laughs> I Kmart doing the oh, same thing. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, good times. Uh, 
what was family life like? Uh, you said you grew up in Arizona um, and Utah. So mm-hmm. that part of Arizona, the Gilbert Mesa, Arizona area is yeah. super Latter-day Saint-ish. I mean, very uh, Mormon-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, was Spencer Kimball? Was it? No, not Kimball. One of the prophets was from Globe. I think it was President Benson. Maybe Benson. Maybe. Yeah. So, 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 some like here yeah. in Arizona, there's I'm mean, clearly pretty deep roots in Mormonism. Oh. But then, <laughs> obviously, Utah County and Springville. But tell us a yeah. little bit about what life was like uh, as a kid in relation to religion. Yeah, my family, we were always super active in the church, uh, My both sides of my family. Uh, my dad was from here in Mesa, my mom was from out in Queen Creek, and we we, we, we lived and breathed the Mormon church and, and the culture, and I have so many fond memories of going to my grandparents' house almost every week for Sunday dinner and for monthly family nights, and We'd go to every cousin's baptism and and all all their mission farewells and and it was a very supportive, close knit family and we had we had family mottos and family scriptures that we would recite together with all my aunts and uncles and cousins and, and songs that my grandma would write and and we'd sing together. It, it was I have so many great memories. Um, of that and uh, yeah, life was life was great. <laughs> um, definitely felt a little off though, just with the feelings I was starting to suspect. Let's talk about that because I, I often begin these interviews with at what point do you realize you're different? And for you, um, you say you felt off. I'm curious why you use that descriptor as opposed to feeling different. Um, I, I'm, I'm nervous to admit this out loud, but I remember we were at a family reunion and I had a cousin who was way older than me and we were doing something with, at a lake or a river and his shirt was off. And I remember thinking at a young age, wow, he is so handsome. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was thinking about at the time, but, and he has no idea. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember thinking that thought was so ugly and asking myself, why do I think this about someone I know and then and then I noticed in other situations the more time went went on but I think that was the first time I noticed it what do you do with feelings like that um, not only as someone who has a hard time putting language to those feelings but also someone who was raised in a super religious home with rules that specifically forbade those types of feelings I memorized every almost every primary song and i played the piano from a very young age and there was that there was that song hum hum your favorite hymn and that became my my uh my motto i guess of just ignore it and do something else and so i became used to that um, early on. Used to the repression. Yeah. Hiding the feelings. Yeah. And we, as great as my family was at being present in each other's lives and, and showing up and serving and all of those great qualities, we we didn't talk about our feelings and I never felt like I could talk about any of these things. And so, yeah, repressed, ignored, denied over and over and over again. I think that's, uh, I think it's paints a super vivid picture for those who listen to episodes like this, watch episodes like this and say like, how, how do you get to the point where you start, building walls and and hiding yourself in these fortresses or i mean for lack of a better term 
like walking yourself and hiding yourself into a closet. But this seems like mm-hmm. the time where you began hanging out in the closet. Yeah. And I remember as I was getting older, all the, all the pop queens of the 90s were coming out and I was obsessed with Britney Spears and Pink and Christina Aguilera and Celine Dion and yeah, my, like my family and my, my dad, my, my cousins all loved watching basketball and, and I, I tried, um, I played sports, my dad was my basketball coach. Um, but then I'd go downstairs after practice or after school and I'd record all these music videos and, and, uh, yeah, uh, it was, it was a lonely, lonely time. Growing up, uh, I want to talk just a little, I kind of want to talk about the tale of two worlds um, because I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about how in, uh, you were influenced by religion um, mm-hmm. and still the messages that you were, re- you were receiving, either from church, from family, um, your own like inner conscience <clears throat> regarding this topic. But then also I want to talk about just real life, like school time, high school, navigating um, this big secret that was kind of kept inside of you because at this point in your life you haven't said a word to anyone no and i don't remember us ever using the g word (laughs) in my house Um, and i i would go to every priesthood session with my dad um, and great memories going with him and, and i felt so cool sitting there with my dad and and I, I remember hear, hearing about homosexuality and what that was and, and being so terrified of how horrible it was and learning about masturbation as I was going through puberty and, and, and we started having more talks about that. And I remember leaders talking about how masturbation led to homosexuality and I became literally terrified of myself um, and touching myself (laughs) and so as that message was echoed over and over again in these church meetings uh, I feared all these things I was afraid of I didn't I don't think I considered myself a homosexual or that I was gay, but I was so scared of that coming true. And so I didn't want to ever do anything that would make that happen. And so um, the, there was the, all the, all the commandments to do. So I, I read my scriptures, I prayed, I didn't masturbate. And, and then um, President Hinckley was really big on talking about pornography and the dangers of pornography. And But all I remember pornography being associated with was disrespecting women. And around this time, we had just gotten the internet as well. And I was also fascinated at the male body and the male physique and... And so I started to look at shirtless men on the internet and that led to other, other things I would look up. But because of what I was hearing at, in these church meetings about pornography and it's, oh, it's all about women and, and, and objectifying women, there was never anything spoken about men and, and pornography being two naked men going at it. And, and, uh, Sorry if that was inappropriate, but um, so I had convinced myself that the things I was looking at was okay because I wasn't disrespecting women. I, it was a curiosity and a fascination, and I was doing it without ever touching myself. And it it was. It, Looking back, I realized, like, oh, my gosh, Cameron, you were crazy. (laughs) Um, But I was so convinced that if I did all the right things, 
if I didn't look at naked women, if I if I if I was a good priesthood holder and my my duties in the in the deacons and teachers and priest quorums, I was the bishop's first assistant. I I blessed the sacrament. Um, I was the seminary president. I conducted firesides. I played the organ in my ward and 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 the piano in primary and and. Meanwhile, I also had this secret that I was in denial that I was also looking at gay pornography, but I didn't think it was real pornography. Um, and the fear of, of um, being found out was, was big. And so I played all the sports that my dad my parents wanted me to, that my friends were doing, um, did, did, did all the things I thought were what a, what a man in the church should do. And I don't think anyone ever suspected it. I'm curious what, um, how much bandwidth that took out of your experience. Um, covering your trail and, and making sure your tracks are hidden is a lot of work. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was, and I, I became a master of the timing of, oh, I'll, I'll babysit our baby sister tonight, mom and dad, and, and when she was asleep, I'd go on the computer, or, or I figured out how to erase the search history, or I would print off pictures and take them back to my room and look at them in the safety of my bedroom and then hide them under my mattress and no one ever caught anything there but there was there was one time uh, the computer froze one night I was trying to print off something I was a, I was a sophomore in high school and so I shut down the computer and went to bed um, my parents knew I was up late doing homework from what they thought and uh, the next morning they get up and they turn the computer on and suddenly the printer works <laughs> and this oh, image no. gets printed <laughs> and they come and wake me up they bring me into their bedroom and they're like Cameron what what is this and I was playing football at the time and I just made some excuse of <laughs> It's motivation for my for my workouts at the at the weight room at school, and of course it was this naked guy just sitting there. <laughs> and uh, um, bless my parents, they didn't know what to say, and so they they had me call the bishop because I was looking at pornography, and and that was interestingly enough when I started to realize like, okay, Cameron, you've been in denial. This this is not good to be looking at. This is pornography, but so I go see my go see my bishop, and I don't know if he had ever talked to anyone in my situation, but we sit down and and he's like, "What brings you in?" and and I just told him I I was looking at pornography. I didn't mention it was gay pornography. I didn't mention it was a man. My parents didn't tell him, um, and so he just counseled me about as if it was regular pornography and I didn't take the sacrament for a couple weeks and then all was fine I went back to normal um, at, but my parents never talked about it ever again um, and after that of course I was doing all the seminary stuff in high school and, and memorized every scripture mastery and uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13, there's no temptation that has taken, and anyway, I could probably say the whole thing if I tried, but um, I started to buckle down even harder that, okay, this this isn't okay, what you've been doing, you need to stop. And so I was committed to um, praying more earnestly and, and thinking, okay, how do I do this better? Okay, instead of praying on my knees, I'll go pray in my closet. I'll turn the light on. I'll pray out loud. Um, 
I'll, I'll write in my journal all these good things I'm reading about in the scriptures. Um, and so I just started to think of more checklist things that I could do to be more righteous. Um, scripture challenges. I, I would volunteer for service things in the, in the priesthood quorums. Um, and I would do pretty well. I, I started to go months at a time where I wouldn't look at anything on the computer and felt like I was, I was doing good, good. And every time I'd go to, go to a priesthood session or conference talks, I felt like every message was for me and what I was doing and, and okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat this. And I remember <sighs> I went to EFY for the first time my junior year and describe what EFY is and so, what that acronym is. Yeah. For. So EFY, it is a church summer camp for, for LDS kids it stands for, especially for youth. Um, and it's, it's a week long camp where you go, they, they do them all over the country. Now I went to one in San Diego with my cousin and, and I remember going for the first time and just having this incredible spiritual experience that it was during, uh, Mindy Gledhill saying, um, abide with me to the eventide. She was on that year's. EFY album and I remember just being overcome with inspiration that I could beat this and from that moment on as a 17 year old kid I didn't look at gay pornography for several years um, until after way after my mission um, and I, I just I was so confident in my ability to beat and overcome my temptation of this attraction I had and this curiosity. Um, and I think I did pretty well <laughs> um, in that regard, <laughs> but here we are. So, so anyway. <laughs> so we, uh, spoiler alert, there's more to right, the story. Right, right, right. <laughs> it doesn't uh, fully include um, Mindy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned, so we're, you're talking about uh, like 16, 17 years old, um, but then it's time for you to serve a mission, which mm -hmm. um, you and I are pretty close in age. So that mission service happened when uh, you're 19 years of age. So I, um, from what you're saying, it sounds like you tried your very best to stay on this straight and narrow. Um, and I'm, so before I get to that, I'm curious, have you ever reached out to Mindy to say how influential she was? I actually haven't. I've, I've thought about it. She was here a few months ago and I wanted to go, but I, I couldn't make her concert. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how she would feel about that message right now with where she's at. But, <laughs> but anyway, I'd love to. <laughs> no, I th and I think, I think the important and cool part about that uh, version of the story is for both people who are at EFY that day, both Mindy Gledhill and for Cameron, there's been a um, mass amount of, uh, of work and, and a mm -hmm. complete shift of opportunity and experience for both people. So yeah. I, I think that's, I, th that's really beautiful, I think. The fact that both Mindy and you have been able to um, move forward um, in very similar directions in, in terms of of life opportunity and and the direction of your experience now so i just thought mm -hmm. that was that might be fitting and there's a correlation there yeah. but we were talking about um, missions so <clears throat> at 19 uh, latter-day saint men serve missions uh, you can call it a mandate you can c call it a requirement it's both the church has used uh, both of those words but uh, you decided as a um, fit and I don't know if you've even used the word gay yet um, or even same-sex attracted, but you know that there's an integral part of yourself that you're um, in a very real sense hiding and stuffing mm -hmm. away. But you set that aside to serve uh, mm -hmm. um, and serve a mission. So tell us where you went and let's yeah. talk about the mission. Yeah, I grew up knowing a mission was the right thing to do and what you were supposed to do. And so that was the next step after high school. and. 
And uh, yeah, so I turned in my papers and I got called to the Tennessee Nashville mission, which was the same mission as my dad uh, about 30 years before. And I was so excited and just thinking, wow, what, a, what an amazing experience. I got to go to the same place as my father. And the only two areas that are still in the mission today um, that he served in, I served in both of them as my first and last areas. And I remember leading up to the mission, I was really nervous about my, my fears of like, oh no, what if I find a, what if I'm with a companion that is really handsome or I, I'd heard horror stories through certain, I don't remember where, but of people falling in love with their companions and getting in trouble and their life going down the drain and, and, the, the path to misery with all that. And so I was really scared. Um, but I was also excited knowing, oh, this is my dad's. This is, this is a tender mercy from, from God. And so I go to Nashville and my mission was amazing. I loved, I loved it. It was at the time the hardest thing I'd ever done. Um, and had some great experiences in every area, met some incredible people. Um, and did not have any distractions. Um, definitely had some companions who were very handsome, but I never once had those those temptations in my head, and and it was fine. And so when the mission was over, I was so proud of myself, and I thought, oh man, like your work is paying off. Like, you're not like the, those other guys that went on missions and didn't make it. You're a survivor. Your faith has, has you've been, you, you've been blessed. Um, my dad, all, all growing up, he would hammer in um, our heads, uh, Doctrine and Covenants 8210. I said, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, you have no promise. And I felt like it had finally worked. And so, of course, the exit interview with the mission, well, next up, Elder, you got to go find a woman. And, 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 and uh, so next on the checklist after a mission was college and dating and finding a wife. And, uh, I think this is an important part of the discussion because often when we uh, share stories about men who enter into relationships with women um, and then eventually marriage to a woman, uh, these mixed orientation marriages, we get a lot of heat. Um, and some of it rightfully so. I'm not saying that um, whether th the topic of mixed orientation marriage is touchy and the topic mm -hmm. of, of mixed orientation marriages um, can often be super painful for both husband and wife, uh, straight or <clears throat> non-straight spouse. This is a very sensitive and difficult discussion when we talk mm -hmm. about mixed orientation marriages. But I also preface all of these stories with kind of this lead up that we've discussed in this episode with religion and with promise. And growing up, and, and this may be really difficult for people who are not Latter-day Saints, but growing up in Mormonism, there is a very real message about growth and about promise. And Doctrine and Covenants 8210, about this idea that if you live up to all of the commandments, if you do all the right things, God will bless you. And he mm -hmm. will, and earlier we talked about burdens in Corinthians, that you, we will not be burdened with, burdened with anything we can't handle. Mm -hmm. um, that is the message that we're raised with as Latter-day Saints. We're also given a promise, especially for Latter-day Saints who are gay. And that message typically was mission, marriage, children. You serve a mission, you end up leaving that mission honorably, you find a woman to take to the temple, you are married uh, for, in Mormon vernacular, time and all eternity, and from that temple marriage come children, um, which is another whole different podcast episode, especially for families who are, aren't able to bear children and, and the pain that that puts those families through, and the pressure that Mormonism places on families and, and uh, reproductive uh, discussions in Mormonism. So I, I want to preface this next part of the interview with that discussion that 
Mormonism is very, very rigid when it comes to these promises. And often gay men will enter into mixed orienta orientation marriages not thinking that I'm, try I'm a gay man trying to marry a woman. Rather, mm -hmm. they're thinking <clears throat> marrying a woman helps my gayness go away because that is what the church has promised me. And why yep. tarnish the marriage by divulging my sexuality if it will just go away when the marriage happens? Totally. So I want to preface that part um, now. Yeah. How much of that was Cameron's Ooh, story? I really appreciated that preface. That was, that was really good. I mentioned a few minutes ago how my family had a family scripture and... This, this echoes everything you were just saying. And the scripture was in the Book of, in the book of Mormon, Alma chapter 44, verse 4. And I still have it memorized. And it says, Now ye see that this is the true faith of God. Yea, ye see that God will support and keep and preserve us so long as we are faithful unto him and our religion. And never will the Lord suffer that we should be destroyed except we should fall into transgression and deny our faith. And that promise is what motivated my entire entire life. And I knew that if I was faithful and doing the next commandment, which was to marry in the temple, uh, that God would support me in my my weakness of these 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 thoughts. So I I get home from my mission and and felt like that was happening. Uh, God supported me on my mission. Now he'll support me in this. And I <clears throat> I met my my wife. We were actually EFY counselors up in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I, I remember walking into the room and, and meeting her. She sat down right next to me. And um, I, we became instantly... Friend, instant friends, and I never once uh, suspected that there was anything wrong with what I was hiding, or, or I didn't even consider it. I, I was hiding anything. I didn't think I was. Um, I met her. We started to date. We kissed, and I didn't kiss a lot of girls growing up. I I tried. <laughs> um, but I remember when, when we kissed, it was very arousing. And I was so excited, thinking, oh, this this works. Yes, I'm fine. And uh, we we dated and, and had, had a great courtship, a very quick courtship. Um, and during that time, we talked about lots of things. Um, she asked me about if I had any challenges with pornography and I was really um, impressed that she would ask that and I remember the first time she asked I I panicked for a second and thought do I need to talk about when I used to look at gay pornography because uh, I'd never looked at straight heterosexual women pornography and and that's that's what she was asking about was how respectful I was towards women and it brought me back to all those times as a kid and so I I, uh, I told her I'd, I didn't have any problems with it and I hadn't looked at gay pornography since I was 17 and I was almost 22 at the time and so we moved on from that conversation and and we got engaged uh, pretty quickly uh, within three months of dating each other. Um, half of that time we were dating long distance. Um, I remember when we got engaged, I called my parents to tell them the good news. And I asked my parents if I should tell her about the time they caught me with that picture I tried to print. Because I think in my head, I felt like I should tell her. But I was so afraid to talk about that and bring up those memories again. I'm curious, were you afraid to come out or were you afraid to disappoint her regarding the pornography? I think I was afraid to disappoint her. 
um, and what she would think. Uh, that's a good question. Because yeah, I, I I still did not think I was I was gay at all. Um, and so when I asked my parents this, uh, they asked, "Well, is it still a problem?" And I said, "No, I haven't looked at it since junior year of high school." And so they they suggested, "Well, if it isn't a problem, you probably don't need to talk about it." And and so I didn't say anything. And uh, <clears throat> so we we got married um, pretty quickly. And things, things were, things were beautiful <laughs> in a lot of ways, but off in a lot of ways. And I think we both knew it, but we didn't know the words to describe it. And so here we were newlyweds at Brigham Young University. She was barely 20. And when it came to intimacy, um, I could go weeks without wanting it again. And she would say things like, wow, I always imagined having a lot more sex as a newlywed. Or I always pictured us ditching class to go home and, and, and have sex and then, and then go back to class in our studies. And, and we never did any of that. <laughs> um, and so th there became some sexual challenges early on. But again, I, I didn't think it was because I was gay <laughs> or same sex attracted. I just thought I, well, I'm, I'm a newlywed. I'm, 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 I'm the man of the house. I'm the priesthood holder. I, I have all this pressure on my shoulders now to, to lead us into the celestial kingdom. And, and so it's just my stress and I'm just tired. And, and I was trying to navigate my major and a career choice. And, and, and so instead of me thinking, oh, you might just not be that into your wife, because you're gay, it's it was something else, and so I was able to talk myself out of every other um, excuse besides the the real one, and uh, and so we we navigated that um, between the the two of us, and no one knew um, what was happening in our home. On the outside, her and I were a beautiful couple, and. I remember we were asked to be photographed for a marketing campaign for Seven Peaks back in the day, and oh, Seven Peaks, that good is old the Seven old Peaks. water park. <laughs> it is. It was uh, Utah County, Provo, Utah's premier water park. The Seven Peaks were seven different slides. Water slides. <laughs> exactly, and uh, so externally, we we were a beautiful couple, and 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 looking back, I think. That was part of the, the reason I had also convinced myself to marry her. Um, I remember our, our very first date after EFY, I had, I had mixed up some calendar things and we had scheduled it the same night as my brother's Eagle Scout Court of Honor. And I had to go because he's my brother and I was in the eagle's nest thing and so I had said to her well we can schedule our date for another time or or you can come meet my entire family because my whole family goes to these things <laughs> and so our first our very first date she meets my entire extended family all my aunts and uncles my grandma and grandpa um all my cousins who came and we had just met each other two weeks ago at EFY, and, and we walk in, and, and she's six feet tall, beautiful, and my, my, one of my aunts 
said to me, Oh, you too have the luck. And uh, I remember hearing that and feeling so safe with her by my side. Um, and so I think I had a fear at that moment um, about what was really inside my self, but I felt like it could be, be covered with her next to me because she was so beautiful and and I was being so righteous and it felt like the perfect the perfect recipe for God to fulfill his promise to me and so we got we got married in the Mesa temple um and immediately tried to have a family. Um, that was the next step. And she was pretty ahead of her school schedule, so she was set to graduate really young. And um, and so next up was was having kids. And and so we we tried for a couple years to get pregnant, and it never worked. And and so, so we decided to go get tested uh, to see, check our fertility. And so we went to a, to a clinic there and, and she got looked at, I got looked at. And it turned out that uh, I had male factor infertility. We had male factor infertility. It was me. <laughs> um, and I couldn't get her pregnant and at that moment, I felt such betrayal um, from, from God because that was the that was the peak of manhood in the church was being a father and, and raising kids and and having a family, and I had done everything right. I mean, except for secretly looking at gay porn and being in denial about it, but but I never watched an R-rated movie. I never cussed. I, besides like one time stealing my parents' car when I was 15, I, I kept all the rules and and I couldn't get her pregnant. And that, destroyed me um, and around the same time my dad was he had just got diagnosed with some stage 4 uh, skin cancer and it was really bad um, and the stress of everything at that moment I I, I gave up um, and that was the first time I looked at gay porn. Um, I was 24 years old, and it had been seven years. I how, still, I still far, didn't masturbate. But how far into your marriage were you? It was just over two years. Um, and of course, I remembered one of the sites from when I was 12 or 13, and. I think I looked up even the same the same things I was looking at back then and it was it became the way I numbed how I was really feeling and that darkness of failure um, and so I remember she knew I was I was really discouraged with the diagnosis and everything my dad was going through. It was a it was an awful time for the family, and so I I went and talked to a counselor on campus there at BYU and 
tailored the conversation towards my dad's health, knowing the entire time that I wasn't addressing what I really needed to, but I didn't want to because I was so afraid. And still thinking, no, this isn't you. This is just a, a slip up. You're stronger than this. And so I hunkered down in my religion classes and, and, and everything else going on in my callings. I was the Sunday school president. I was the primary pianist. And <sighs> anyway, um, so then I started to have to fight those temptations again pretty early on, I guess two years in while navigating infertility and that journey and it's a whole other story <laughs> it, I mean we I mean we really opened up a recipe of disaster when it comes to especially when we have conversations about authenticity and honesty uh, which are kind of the hallmarks of Mormonism uh, the church teaches um, so readily the importance of being honest and the importance of being authentic and uh, living the fullest measure of your creation is something that the church often uh, discusses and all that we've talked about so far in this episode leads up to this idea that this is exactly the life that you wanted. Uh, this is uh, Mormonism um, in its truest form. You were, um, you were doing, just like you said, everything right. You were doing mm -hmm. it all the right way and dying inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a scary, scary time. Um, and the, and the fear of not doing enough just kept getting bigger and bigger. So I, it has been, it's been a journey to, to look at this backwards and Like, forgive myself for being at that level of denial. Um, I wanted her to be a mom so bad. And she, she had dreamed of being a mom and... I mean, I had dreamed of being a dad. That was the next thing in the in the in the in the checklist in the ladder to the to the social kingdom there. And so here we were going through fertility treatments, and suddenly I <sighs> trying to this is about to get really really vulnerable. <laughs> um, suddenly I have to masturbate to get my wife pregnant. And the first time we go to the clinic to do just a simple intrauterine insemination, that's what they're called, and I go back to the collection room. And of course, everyone, all the staff thinks so. It's just, normally, it's a quick go in there, you're in and out pretty easy. And, and, the anxiety I had trying to masturbate for the first time in my life <laughs> um, as a married righteous person I was trying to be I, I and, and the fear of what I remember hearing as a, as a little kid about masturbation making you a homosexual and It took me an hour and a half to collect a sample of sperm. And the humiliation on top of the anxiety in that room, it was a lot. <laughs> um, the procedure didn't work. So then I had to do it again. And so we started to look up ways to help men masturbate better to increase chances like oh try an energy drink beforehand and 
And again, the second time took over an hour to, to give them some, some stuff. And the procedure failed again. And my, my wife was so supportive and on board with trying to help me before the third procedure, she was sweet enough to make a, a photo book of her in beautiful attire. I'll, just, I'll say that. And she gave it to me as a gift between the two of us. And it was the most thoughtful thing she'd ever done. Um, and I remember getting that gift, knowing what it took for her to do that, and also having the thought of, this isn't going to help. <laughs> um, and that, that was crushing. Um, anyway, <sighs> I'll spare the rest of the details, but... We ended up doing in vitro fertilization and it worked and we got kids and, and she became a mom, I became a dad and and yeah. So we reached the next ladder and we were on our way. Thank you. That was super vulnerable. And I know that uh, that's not easy to share something so special, but also so difficult in that in that experience. I also think it's pivotal to help paint the picture of what's to come. And I think it's, to me, we're opening up the doorway, literally, um, you just now performed or did something that was a gateway that opened a literal door to what your future could look like. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this methodically. You've, you were looking at porn uh, as early on as 12. So now we're another 12 years, a whole life later. You're married, living in God's country in, mm -hmm. in, in Provo, Utah, BYU, and for the very first time, you masturbate. And for the very first time, you now connect. This is what I'm, I'm hearing from this story. You're connecting that act with something that you have hid your whole life. And knowing, very literally, the fear of God put into you, that if you do this, this is what you will become. And it's almost as if you you can't put this genie back in the box. I'm, I'm curious how yeah. life unfolds now for you. That's literally how it felt, was the window was open now. And it, it became harder and harder to ignore those thoughts. And so I would go months, some, sometimes years, at a time between looking at things on the internet. Um, but I, I became, I don't, I don't think I was addicted, but maybe that's what addicts say. But from what I've understood, I would like binge and purge from what I've learned in my work with therapists and stuff. And, and, that fear became a lot bigger that, that this this is in there and it hasn't gone away um, and there would be times after that when she had suspected that i was gay she would ask me straight out um if if i was gay and and i still had never used those words um, I had never had a gay experience other than what I had watched. And so, of course, I would just deny and be like, no. And, and then whenever she would ask, I, that would be my sign of, Cameron, you're not doing enough. You need to try harder. 
you're being weak, you're stronger than this. And so again, I would just buckle down and, and do all the things I was doing back in high school. And, and it started to help and still just convinced because of where we were at in our life, we had, we had a temple marriage. We had children. Our family was beautiful. Um, it was going to work out. And, and, and I would have these incredible spiritual experiences um, where I'd go to the temple or, or, or I, would, I would hear a, hear a hymn or a musical number or she, had a, she has a beautiful singing voice and we were that couple that would perform in all the church meetings. I'd play the piano for her, she would sing and we would just have the, I'd have these moments of just like, okay, this, this is joy. This is, this is what God has in store for me. And it's, this is it. And, but then there would be, there would be times where she was, I don't want to speak for her, but she'd feel rejected. Um, sexually and and at times left humiliated when she would do certain things and and I wouldn't respond in the way that she had hoped or wanted or expected and seen in all the chick flicks and the romance the bachelor and 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 so when those times would happen, that there were a couple times and, and <clears throat> where, well, I am, I'm not proud. I'm not proud of some of the things that I did to make things work between us. After those experiences, I would go, she would, We'd have a huge fight over her being rejected and humiliated. She'd go to bed falling asleep in tears. And I would just feel awful. And the only thing I could think of doing to fix it was giving her what she wanted. And so I would go in the bathroom or something and I'd, I'd look at a few pictures and get excited. And I'd go wake her up. And we would, we'd have sex. And she had no idea I would do that. And again, my warped mind was telling myself, I'm not looking at pornography and masturbating. I'm not looking at it touching myself and making myself feel good. I'm looking at it and then going to make her feel good. And, and sexual intimacy is so important between marriages. And, and again, I, I was, my thinking was so easy to say now, it was so confused um, that I had thought that was okay. Um, And I'm not, I'm not proud of myself for that, but, but I, it, it's, it's what I did. I'm, and I'm cur curious where, or at what point, um, do we get to the part of the story where this is no longer sustainable, that this, um, opportunity and <clears throat> in my own mixed orientation marriage, as I'm listening to your story, I'm just remembering all of those um, opportunities, all of those examples, uh, those times mm -hmm. where my own wife in those relation in, in my relationship felt inadequate, <clears throat> felt um, like she wasn't a good enough wife, that she wasn't a good enough mother, that something about her was the cause of of all very similar experiences that you had in in your relationship, both sexually. Um, emotionally mm -hmm. um, all of all of those aspects of of our relationship suffered 
because I wasn't honest with myself and her right. about who and what I was. So in your own experience, um, when did this become unsustainable? What changed? What yeah. broke? Yeah. It was interesting. Um, in 2015, I was in chiropractic school and there was a, a talk given at an assembly and, and this motivational speaker was talking about this concept called the gap. And it was all about the, the energy required to maintain this gap between who you are and who you want the world to perceive you as. I remember hearing that years ago and, and, and thinking about that as our marriage was continuing on. And, and so when I would have these episodes where I would look at pornography, I would, all of our devices were connected. And so I would, I'd have to clear my tracks. I'd have to clear the history on my phone, on our iPad, on our, on our, on our desktop computer, <clears throat> um, but I had a system down, and and she never, never knew. And I remember there was one point where I had erased the history on my phone and on the computer, but we had we had we hadn't touched the iPad in like eight months or something, and. So I remember purposely not going to touch the iPad. <sighs> the story I want to tell myself is that I, I didn't forget. <laughs> I, I was tired of maintaining this. And I was wanting her to find out. Because that's what happened. Eventually she, she, looked, she got on the iPad. But it was, it was months after I had looked at things on my phone and she called me at work one day and she she said cam i found something on the ipad do you want to tell me anything and that's all she said and i immediately knew exactly what she was talking about and I, I just, I said, I'll talk to you when I get home. Um, interestingly enough, this was the night before I was about to have a big grand opening at my practice. We had just rebranded things and we were going to have a huge block party with hundreds of people in the community and the chamber of commerce for a ribbon cutting. I was flying a doctor in to work for me and, and then this happened and I remember thinking, okay, she had seen some questionable things I had looked at on Instagram before, and I was able to weasel my way out of that. I was like, oh, they're, they're just personal trainers. They give me workout ideas. and um, So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I, can, I can think of something. But I, I remember just at that point... <sighs> I realized I can't do this anymore. If, if everything the church told me to do was gonna make this go away, it would have happened by now. And here we are. And so I went home from work that night and she had our kids at piano lessons at her mom's and I remember waiting in our our bedroom and she she gets the kids all set up downstairs and she walks in and she shuts the door and I'm just sitting there and that was the, f the first thing I say to like she I remember her standing across the room and that was the first time I said the words I'm gay and she was so kind. Um, of course, I was sobbing and shaking. She comes over to me and embraces me. 
And the first thing out of her mouth is, Cameron, it's okay. This makes sense. For so many years, I've thought I wasn't pretty enough for you or sexy enough. And now this connects all these dots for me. Like this logically makes sense. Like, okay. And she was so calm about it. I was in shock. And I was like, wait a second. This is horrible. I'm a horrible person. And I was just disgusted with myself. And she just helped me and, and said it was okay. And I had never felt that love before from anyone. And it was a beautiful experience between her and I that I will forever cherish. Um, and so uh, the funny thing was the next day we... The, the doctor was staying at our house, so we couldn't talk about it for a whole weekend. <laughs> and uh, and we had to put on this front that we were fine, and we were trying to, to, to just schmooze this doctor to come work for me. And the next week, uh, I go talk to the bishop, and, and we go in there, and we start to realize, okay, we have to navigate this. But but again, the intention of talking to him was not about me being gay. It was about pornography. But I knew, like, okay, she knows. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell the bishop I'm I'm gay. And uh, his advice was to not talk about it. Don't don't talk about this elephant in the room. It'll make it bigger. Um, and so. That became our our next mission. Was oh every couple deals with something in their in their marriage. Uh, poor finances. A husband's addicted to pornography, or he has an affair, or or they're angry, or, or something. They're who knows what. It, this is ours, and it's going to be okay. And so we heeded that counsel, and we didn't talk about it for a couple, for a couple weeks. Um, I remember on Mother's Day weekend, shortly after this, we, uh, we went on a road trip to San Diego with our kids just to escape from everything that had happened. And we're in the car. We left really early in the morning. Our kids were asleep. And after like 20 minutes in the car, we realized we I have to talk about this. She had so many questions. And we couldn't think of anything else to talk about. We've been talking about all these superficial things. And, and so we started mentioning the bishop's advice of like, well, he said not to talk about it. Oh, but I have questions. And, and imagine if you were in my situation, Cameron, like, wouldn't you have questions too? And, and, and so... She start. I'm like, okay, well, ask, ask, ask away. We can, let's do it. And no one had ever asked me questions about it in my life. And I didn't know how to answer some of these questions because I had never let myself think about it before. And, and so I struggled to answer things in a way that, she liked and and that left her frustrated and angry and we fought for the entire drive to san diego and thankfully our kids slept for most of the drive but um we knew that we needed to address this and that i needed to figure out words answer these questions because in order for us to make a marriage work she needs to know certain things um, and so that became our next our next 
the mission was we're gonna we're gonna make this marriage work, but we have to talk about it, and and it's gonna be okay. And so, still convinced in the promises of the gospel, um, we hunkered down on our temple attendance. We went every single week. We prayed even more earnestly together. Um, we volunteered for every service opportunity we could. We started to get connected in the LDS LGBT community. That was when I first discovered your podcast and the North Star community. It was it was a journey. <laughs> I'm curious what you intended um, this journey to yield. What what outcome did was the outcome unified between you and your wife? Uh, were there separate outcomes that you wanted to see <clears throat> as a result of A, talking about the elephant in the room, and B, expanding those horizons? Oh, that is a great question. I, I think we had convinced ourselves that we had the same outcome in mind, which for me it was to just survive our mortal life and and I convinced myself that oh this won't be a problem in the resurrection um, it'll all be fine and, and and I again I can't speak for her but I think I think her outcome hope was that it would be fixed and that with all the work we were doing I would suddenly crave her the way that she'd always wanted to be desired. Um, and so we started going to different Mormon therapists and, and find the reason I was gay. Well, what caused it? Uh, was it your relationship with your dad? No, my dad was in, is incredible. And, and were you molested as a child? No, <laughs> I never touched myself and no one did either. Um, but then as we, as we started to um, talk to therapists about intimacy, they were helping us approach sex in a more functional way of, okay, Cameron, you can, you can focus on, on making, making her feel good and, and, and don't worry about yourself. Sex isn't always about pleasure and joy. It's... Uh, um, it's about other forms of connection and, and getting needs met. And um, anyway, that's a whole other another story. But I was just trying to get get through, and so I studied the gospel more earnestly. And the more I looked at what the church taught about same sex attraction. Um, they, they, they didn't talk about it as a condition that is going to be cured in the resurrection, like someone that is born handicapped or someone that loses a child. You're going to get this opportunity in the resurrection to be made perfect. Um, there's no, there's no. At least I maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen an official statement from a from a, a, a leader that that. Those who have same-sex attraction are not going to have that once they die and they're resurrected. The scriptures say um, your thoughts, your knowledge, your desires, all that goes with you in the afterlife. I um, can't remember that scripture mastery, so I guess I wasn't that much of a scriptorium, but it suddenly started to not make any sense of if this is going to be how I am after this. Um, what are we doing? And, and she would say things like, Cameron, just think about how great it will be when we're, we're resurrected and, and we just, we make babies eternally. And in my head, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, it didn't sound like a heaven that I wanted to be in. And so suddenly the plan of salvation that I was so 
um, confident in suddenly started to, to crumble. And like, I don't fit here. I don't think this makes any sense for me. Um, and, and I think once that started to enter my mind, anyway, it, it led to the outcome that where we're at now. So, How long was that sustainable? From that opportunity to come out to your wife in your bedroom mm -hmm. to the point where you say, uh, things have to change. What was that time frame? Yeah, it was just over a year. Um, and we had, uh, we had tried everything we could think of to, to make things work. At one point, she had given me the green light to go and sleep with a man. And, and, and she said, why don't you just go, go do this and then come home. And, and it's like, no, that's not, that's not going to fix this. Um, but we would just have the same argument over and over again. And it got to a point, I hope someday she will share her story of where she was at. Um, but it became unsafe for us to stay together. And I knew that she and me, we wouldn't make it if I continued to put her through um, that experience of marriage to a man that did not desire you the way that you'd always dreamed. And so after the same argument we'd had several times, I was done. Nothing we were doing was helping and I just, I suggested, I think, I think we might want to consider a divorce as a healthy option. And that was the first time we had ever really considered it. Um, and so she said, well, let's, let's pray about it. Our kids were at a birthday party at a friend's and I remember kneeling down in the living room and we were holding hands after having a traumatic argument, explosive argument, and we both took turns offering a prayer. And that was the moment we both felt like, okay, I think, I think this is what we need to do. But even after that, we were in, we were still in denial. So we called our therapist and and asked for an emergency meeting that same day. Um, some friends to, or, or her parents took the kids, and we went and met with our therapist on a Saturday night for three hours. It was the most expensive therapy session of our marriage, and I, I remember leaving that session with the therapist. And again, I think, I think we had different outcomes. Um, my thought was, I think, I think I was afraid to say or put my foot down, no, we need a divorce. It was more like, oh, well, I think, I think if we work with Carol, she'll help us navigate staying together or she'll help us divorce peacefully. <laughs> She was, my ex-wife was all, all gung-ho with, we got this. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to beat this. We went to bed that night. The next morning was Mother's Day. And <clears throat> wake up the next morning. And uh, I remember we were sitting up in bed. And she says to me, Cam, I've been up for hours just looking at you, and she said, I, I feel at peace with us getting a divorce. I think you're right. And, and she knew I was too afraid to 
to ask for it again. And so again, we knelt down that morning. All the while, our kids are bringing her in their homemade Mother's Day gifts. And <laughs> they had no idea what was going on. And uh, we, we prayed again about the decision and felt that's what God was telling us to do. And I, and I remember... Again, she, we were hugging, embracing, crying, and she just she said, Cameron, you have loved me every way you're capable, and I've loved you every way that I'm capable, but it's not enough. And uh, interestingly enough, like her parents were randomly coming over that morning to bring her a Mother's Day gift. Her parents never randomly stopped by our house out of the blue. And, and, and so they sent a text, we're on our way. <laughs> and uh, here we were just deciding to end our marriage. And it was terrifying. Um, anyway, it, it, uh, here we are. <laughs> here we are. Um Man, I want to I want to now go in two directions with this part of the story because um, there's a lot, and and that that was a lot, and I'm I'm listening and recalling my own experiences and, and remembering the conversations that I had as well with my wife, where we both needed to give each other the opportunity to love and be loved, and that mm -hmm. was ultimately the deciding factor in our divorce, and I am also the one who pro uh, who just refused for a number of reasons a lot of them centered around my faith that mm -hmm. it will just get better that this will finally something will fix us something will change something different some new factor that we haven't thought of yet some yeah. commandment some scripture some blessing some something that we just haven't tried hard enough yet to right. embrace will finally fix us and will finally be the balm of Gilead that we totally absolutely needed in our relationship. And that never came. And, and for us, we had that very similar uh, conversation. And my wife said, you deserve to love and be loved. I deserve to love and be loved. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to divorce. And without her taking the lead in that situation, I can't imagine how much longer we would have tried. Right and denied each other the opportunity to live the fullest measure of our creation. Yeah. I'm so it's clear uh, you're divorcing that you are now moving in opposite directions and and the disassemble the the disem disassembly of of a relationship is not easy. That can mm -hmm. be its own <clears throat> whole podcast. Right. And and as you talked about um, the important part of that story requires both sides of the story to tell. Mm -hmm. And and I only want, and, and thankfully, um, I've, I've only wanted to hear your mm -hmm. um, experience. And, and I, I've always opened this platform for other, the other side of the story as well to, to gain a better understanding. Um, but from your perspective, as this is disassembling and, and you're taking the house of cards down mm -hmm. one at a time, We've addressed the spouse, but there's two other factors that are often very prevalent in situations like this, and those are coming out to children and then coming out to family. I want to understand in your experience what that was like. How did you come out to your kids, yeah. um, and, and then how did you come out to your families, and what were those yeah. reactions like? Great question. Um... Before we decided to get divorced, <clears throat> um, early on after I came out to her, we felt like we couldn't navigate that alone. And so she, she knew it was my story to tell, um, but I decided to start telling people close to us in our family that I was gay and this is what we're dealing with in our marriage. Um, and so I, I first came out to her parents before mine um, while, we, while we, we were navigating staying married. I came out to my parents um, shortly after that. Um, 
Eventually, our immediate families all knew, and a few of our closest friends and our church leaders. Um, and so we had this circle of people who was aware of the burden we were carrying in our marriage. And, and it, it gave, it kind of gave us a safety net of, of people we could talk to when it was really hard. <clears throat> um, but we did not tell our kids yet. And, and, and so when we decided to get divorced, um, we didn't, we didn't want to make up some weird excuse of why mom and dad weren't going to live together anymore. anymore. Our, our sons at the time were seven. Our daughter had just turned five, just barely turned five. And again, she was very respectful in allowing me to be the one to share. Um, so before I even moved out, like, I wanted our kids to know what was happening and why. Um, <clears throat> and so one day, one Sunday after church, <laughs> we sat down on the couch, the same couch her and I had prayed on to know about getting divorced. And I, I say to the kids, um, you know how... So uh, one of my sons has really pretty blue eyes and my other son's got green eyes and um, our daughter has a really infectious smile and laugh. I was like, so I said, you know how Heavenly Father gave you these, these, different, these different colored eyes and how he, how he gave you all these freckles? Well, Heavenly Father made, made your dad where he just likes boys more than girls. Um, and because of that, mom and dad aren't going to be married anymore. And just kept it as simple as that. Um, and, and so they knew early on. Um, and as they've gotten older, um, my sons are now 11. My daughter is almost nine in a couple weeks. Um, it has allowed us and me to freely talk to them about being gay and what that means. Um, and I, I'm grateful that they know because um, it, it has brought us even closer together. Um, I'm really grateful for that. We started um, this podcast episode with... Um a lot of discussion about the importance in your personal orbit with Mormonism and the church mm -hmm. and how influential that was in the structure of who Cameron was mm -hmm. and how the church in a very real way, in a very honest way, uh, not only were the foundation stones to who you were, but was the steeple. Mm -hmm. All of your life was centered around the church and its promises. Did coming out and the divorce alter that foundation? Did it change that structure? And if so, how? Oh, man. Um, yeah, there's that primary song, I belong to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know who I am. I know God's plan. When I came out, I, those words echoed in my mind of this church has owned me my entire life and convinced me to think a certain way. And when I started to slowly step into my authenticity. And I, I hate that word, <laughs> um, but it's, it's fitting. But um, I was lost and alone. Uh, there was no structure of where to find answers, 
to my own questions about who I was without that belief system or without that church culture. I didn't feel like I fit in anymore. I would still go. I would take my kids. I would go with them. In fact, her and I attended church together for a few months after our divorce. But um, I had to really sit in the silence and feel what was in there. Um, and that was really scary. And to, to ask myself my own questions of what do I really think about certain things in life, in the world, and, and, and my family. Uh, um, anyway, it's been a journey. <laughs> uh, but it's been a, it's been a, it's been a good one. Um, and I am grateful for how my family has tried to show up and support in the way they know how. Um, I'm really lucky there. You, uh, you hate the word authenticity. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious, um, authenticity aside, what does life like, look like now? Um, <laughs> what does, uh, what does Cameron's world look like post divorce, uh, post Mormonism, mm -hmm. post closet, post facade? Um, and we've mentioned this somewhat briefly throughout this episode. Uh, you're a doctor. You are a working professional mm -hmm. um, in the community. So you're known. Um, your patients know you. You're uh, the professional um, physician world knows you. What is life like on the outside? Yeah. And was all of this worth it? Short answer is yes. But I think what I have learned... And, and what life is like now, it, I used to think in such extremes and black and white. And the things I've experienced through this learning process is that there is so much gray in the world and, and navigating that there is beauty there. Um, there is color there. And... I am not a perfect parent. I don't have all the answers to questions like I thought I did. But I'm finding that I am gaining such confidence in being okay not having an answer to certain things. Uh, and that feels good. I, I am excited about um, what my future looks like. Uh, with my kids, we've had countless conversations about the church. Um, they still go with their mom, and, and again, I'll take them occasionally, but um, <sighs> they have this fear about what's going to happen to me after, after I die and this fear that they're never going to see me again. And so we talk about that a lot. And, and my son will come to me in tears and anxiety of, Dad, what if the church is right? And we, we, we've had these heavy conversations about this. And while on one hand I am furious that my children are thinking about this at their young ages, I am so grateful for the opportunity that it gives us to talk about the reality of of the unknown and the excitement in the unknown and, and and of I'll say to my son you know Nash I I don't know if the church is maybe they are <laughs> but it is so nice not to live in fear of 
of not doing enough, not being enough. Um, and, and again, back to that word authenticity. I, I don't know why I hate it so much. I think, I think at the time when I was trying to navigate my marriage, I would hear people say like, oh, I'm coming out and living in my authenticity. And I think I was just jealous. So I started to hate that word. But um, my authenticity is, um, I think, finding solitude in the unknown and being open and willing to learn what is out there. Um, and to experience the aspects of life that have brought joy I never thought would in not worrying about being single and, and having a partner or, or, or <clears throat> um, not showing up to certain family religious events anymore, um, but just being okay with, you know, I'm just going to take some time for myself and, and I'm going to find my peace. Um, and I'm getting there. Looking back, now that you've had a good 20 years to navigate from... 15-year-old, 12-year-old Cameron, what advice would you give young Cameron regarding his future today and the opportunities available to him? Oh, man. I remember, uh, this is, I have thought about this question because I've heard you ask a lot of your interviewees. I... I would tell him not to be afraid. Um, if I would have known back then the way my family would respond to who I am, uh, I life would be very different. Um, so yeah, I would I would tell him not to be afraid, and that it that you're okay, um, and you're gonna be okay. Is there anything you wanted to say? You wanted the audience to take from this interview that we haven't talked about already. I think. I think the biggest thing that I continue to be blown away with when I listen to your podcast is the magnitude of this experience in other people's lives. And I compare that to how alone I felt and thinking I was the only one. And so I think just a little reminder of... My story is not that special. <laughs> it's not that unique. Um, that there are so many who suffer in silence and take the words and dare to the end very differently <laughs> than other people. And to be kind and recognize that there is gray. And in the midst of that gray are some pretty beautiful rainbows. Amen. Amen. Cameron, thank you. Uh, thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing so much of your story um, candidly and articulately um, in, in a way that helps people better understand your experience and in a very real way, their own experience as well as they begin to draw parallels I think one thing that I, I learned from this experience and, and of you sharing your story is how hard we try to be things that we are not. 
and mm. how we believe so fully and so intently on the words of other people when our faith tradition is so responsive and so efficiently teaches us the importance of personal revelation mm -hmm. and how this is an individual journey and how our relationship is between us and God, but yet so controlling in the way that that revelation can happen. Mm -hmm. I just really appreciated how um, you were able to share a story of, of hope and a story of effort. So others who are in the same situation, who are navigating the white knuckle, um, bruised and bloody, calloused knees version of this experience, can see that it's okay to be authentic. It's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be honest. It's okay to live the mm. fullest measure of your creation. It's also okay, and this is relative to so many stories and so many interviews that I've had on the podcast, to do some of the things that you think are dark. Mm -hmm. This tunnel that isn't well lit. It's okay to step into the darkness to find that the way is lighted ahead. And in so many experiences, myself included, I didn't have to sacrifice any of my values and any of my morals to get here. Yep. And from your story, I recognize that you didn't have to do that either. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable again. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, for those who have questions, uh, who may want to contact you, um, Mm -hmm. Are you willing and open? Yeah, they can. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Shirtless? <laughs> there might be a couple on there. We, we talked to, <laughs> and that we joked off air as before we started the interview. Um, I, I do tongue in cheek, make fun of uh, some people every now and then. <laughs> uh, typically, the color of their hair describes the crisis in which some people are in. <laughs> So, um, exactly. So I had to throw in the shirtless <laughs> thirst trap uh, on Instagram as well. So. <laughs> Amen. All telltale signs. Right. Uh, only right. for fun. That's, I know. That's I only know. for fun. <laughs> uh, so Instagram and Facebook, those of you who are uh, watching on a video version of this episode, <clears throat> uh, you can leave uh, comments in this comment section as well, especially on YouTube. That usually um, is a great place for people to have kind of an open conversation. Uh, regarding these these interviews and, and questions and comments about the interviewee. So uh, we invite you to do that. Again, thank you, Cameron, um, for sharing a little bit of your story, for being open and vulnerable and can, uh, just can, candid Cameron. Candid that's, Cameron, there you go. That's what you were. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Again, for those of you who are listening and watching, we invite you to participate uh, in the chat. Uh, if you are listening on an audio version of our podcast, we invite you to... Um, Leave a, a rating and a comment or uh, subscribe to the channel where you're listening. We are welcoming our new Amazon podcast family as well. So if you are listening on the uh, Amazon family of podcasts, we welcome you to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. And it's because of the many viewers and listeners to uh, the, the podcast, to the Latter Gay Stories podcast, that we were picked up from, uh, by Amazon. So thank you to our dedicated listeners and those who support the Latter Gay Stories podcast. It's stories like yours. It's stories like Cameron's and it's stories like mine that help us each continue writing our own latter-day story.